Welcome all alumni, parents, faculty, students, and teachers. I'm Frank Felkowitz, and I'm a senior here at Canisius. Today I have the pleasure to interview Mr. Robert Rieger, class of 1966, and current chairman of the Board of Trustees. Mr. Rieger graduated with the distinguished honor of winning the Mr. Canisius Award. He went on to study at Fordham University and then proceeded to earn his JD at the University of Virginia School of Law. Mr. Rieger was senior counsel for the law firm Morgan, Lewis, and Bacchius in New York City, where he specialized in investor-owned utilities and regulated industries in the electric and natural gas markets. He joins me here today at Canisius to reflect on his experiences and how he sees the path of Canisius' future. Mr. Rieger, thanks for being here. My pleasure. So let's start with a question prior to your high school career. Yeah. Whose decision was it to send you to Canisius High School? Um, well, uh, to, be, to be honest with you, it was my decision to send me to Canisius High School. Um, you know, I, I went to St. Aloysius School in uh, Cheektowaga. Um, my family history was all with St. Joe's Collegiate Institute. Mm -hmm. That's where my grandfather went and my uncle went. And uh, so I was the oldest of the, of the grandchildren. And it came time for the decision to be made as to, uh, as to what uh, high school to go to. And I wanted, I simply said to my parents, I want to go to the best high school. And, and back then there was no, you know, there was no, uh, uh, when, when you were raised in a Catholic background, you know, you, you were, the, the only available schools were Catholic schools. I mean, you didn't consider anything like Nichols or any other school. It had to be a Catholic school. And Canisius had this incredible reputation. I, I knew that I wanted to pursue um, a, some sort of a career or learning with, in debate and oratory. And Canisius, at that particular point in time, was all over the press with, uh, you know, debaters and orators that were winning awards. Mm -hmm. So um, I basically said, um, I'm, uh, Canisius is my place. And, um, and I remember that my, my father said to me, look, uh, that's expensive. I think the starting tuition was $280 wow. for, for a year. And uh, he said, it's expensive. And if I start this with you, I've got to make this. I have to give the same opportunities to each of your brothers. And I'm not sure I can afford that. And I said, I said, Dad, don't worry about it. I'll uh, I'll pay my way. Uh, I'll work on the uh, on the weekends, or I'll work during the summer, but I'll figure it out, and I'll I'll pay my way or supplement whatever you can give me. And uh, so that's what happened. I had you know summer jobs every summer, and was able to, you know, put together enough money to pay in part my tuition, and I made it through Canisius. Oh well. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. So what changes did you make to Canisius during your time as a student? What changes did I make? Yes. Um, probably very few. Uh, I, was a, uh, I was a very uh, straight, um, respectful, conservative, slash middle of the road student. Uh, th that was the way you survived at Canisius. It wasn't, uh, you know, the, the role of discipline was, uh, was huge. And uh, you didn't want, you didn't really want to be too visible, uh, be because if you were, uh, you, you know, and you sort of stepped out of line, there was there were repercussions. Now, it, it, I have to tell you, that it's very hard for somebody who's six foot five to to be invisible. Um, so, uh, you know, and again, a conversation with my father, he sort of said, "Look, you have to understand that you stand out in a crowd, regardless of the fact." Uh, regardless of really anything, you're just physically, you're very tall. So that means that there's a spotlight on you and you've got to conduct yourself in a way that's uh, uh, representative of our family values and the school you're going to. So, so anyway, that's, that's what I did. And, um, you know, at, at Canisius, we, we uh, you know, we had a, a very, very good um, debate and oratory group. And uh, when I was a, uh, when I was a sophomore at Canisius, the debate group that I was a part of, uh, which was the novice uh, debate group, won the uh, New York State uh, uh, Debate and Oratory uh, Award for Best Novice Team in, in New York State. And uh, it, was, it was, so I mean, there was all the work associated with continuing the legacy of excellence mm -hmm. in the debate and oratory. 
our world, and and I think that that had an impact on, you know, on uh, on Canisius. Um, I was active in you know in, in student government uh, matters, and you know if there was if there was a fundraising opportunity to help the missions, which I think mm -hmm. is what we what we actually were concerned about because the Jesuits were embedded in the Micronesia Polynesia mm -hmm. area, and and so we, yeah, so you know, uh, but. But mostly we were, you know, we were kind of studying hard and trying to stay out of trouble. And uh, I don't know that that made much of an impact, except maybe it set an example for my two mm -hmm. brothers who followed me here. <laughs> Why do you think you won Mr. Canisius in 1966? Um, uh, well, I tell you, nobody was more surprised than I was when I, when I, when I won that, because I, I was in a, a collection of, of classmates that uh, had been, you know, really successful athletes and, um, and, and really very prominent um, members of the class. Now, I, I guess I was a prominent member of the class, but I was prominent for other reasons. Uh, as I said, it was the debate and oratory thing. I guess I just had, I had a naturally big mouth and I was able to express myself. Um, but I think part of it was that um, I, I was, is that I had, I probably had more of a constituency in, in the junior, sophomore, and freshman classes than I had in my own class. I mean, I had very, I had very good and very deep friendships in my class, I don't wanna, but my brother Mark was a freshman, and Mark was a very prominent freshman, a very funny guy, good athlete, and he had a lot of friends, and you know, and, and I think he probably corralled them into voting for me. Um, you know, uh, um, I, I was I was working with with sophomores and, and with juniors uh, in the debate and oratory area and in the student government, and I I was not a, a person that paid a lot of attention to what grade you were in. I tried to to kind of I tried to treat people the way I wanted to be treated. I guess that's the way to say it, the way that I would hope to have been treated. And I, and I think that, that you know, that um, my fellow students, you know, s saw that. They, they, they saw it. I mean, it wasn't, um, it wasn't something that I thought a lot about. It was just sort of the way I was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, you know, and I, I, I guess I, I represented something that, uh, that they felt was worth voting for. Uh, that's, about, that's about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Not not very uh, not very dramatic, is it? So, following that, several years later, you won the Distinguished Alumni Award in two thousand eight. Yeah. Why do you think you won that as well? Well, I mean, um, first of all, I'd been on the board for six years. Okay. Um, I had been uh, very uh, outspoken about the building of the two new buildings. I felt mm -hmm. that that was. Uh, a critically important thing for Canisius to do because I thought that it represented to the community at large that Canisius was here to stay mm -hmm. and that we were thinking about uh, about our future and about the quality of our, our, our environment of buildings, our facilities. Um, uh, and I made, I made some, you know, substantial donations to support uh, what I thought was a, an evolving um, commitment to these buildings. I mean, because, you know, when you build a building, it, it's maybe, maybe an architect comes in and says, well, here are the plans, and this is the building, and nobody has anything to say about it except go ahead. But that's not what happened at Canisius. You know, there were, there were plans, there was debate, there was argument, there was concern and fear about, about assuming this debt that was necessary in order to be able to, uh, uh, to build the buildings. There was concern about the capital campaign. And Father Higgins, who was then uh, the, the president of Canisius and, and was a friend of mine, and he would share with me the, the complexities of putting the plan together, you know, I would come in for a board meeting and I would say, hey, this, this is better than the last time. So I'm willing to write a check, and I'm willing to have you, Father Higgins, tell the rest of the board that I've done that in a way that maybe provides an incentive to the board mm -hmm. to uh, to take a chance to to, to invest as well, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so I, I'd done that over a period of time, and I had I'd worked um, you know with Father Higgins uh, in a variety of roles, um, 
and then you know the then the the point was that you know I'd, I'd had a very uh, successful career in New York practicing law mm-hmm. in the corporate securities uh, arena regulated utilities and so forth and um, um, and I'm sure that uh, at least some subset of, of people at Canisius realized that that was a fairly mm-hmm. a fairly prominent career and uh, th- thought that it was appropriate to recognize me. I, I, I will say that, you know, I, I don't mean to be, uh, I, I don't want to uh, create any misimpressions here, but it, it, you know, it certainly helps when you're in a position to make donations. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so there's, you know, it's sort of putting your money where your mouth is mm-hmm. and then having the response to that be, uh, we, we, want, we, we want to be able to recognize the person that's, that's made that investment with us. So mm-hmm. I think that's part of the way it got um, teed up. Interesting. So then, so then recently you were named chairman of the board of trustees. So what are the responsibilities of that job or position? The board? Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, no, the, the um, so I, I've, been ch- I've been chairman of the, of the board for about 18 months. And, you know, you know primarily the responsibility is to uh, is, is to uh, coalesce the board um, mm-hmm. on a, uh, well, the first year it was every, I think we had a meeting once a month. Uh, this year we've been uh, more efficient, so we've been able to have meetings once a quarter. Um, but preparing for those meetings, making sure that the committees do their job, uh, issue their reports, uh, interacting with the principal, uh, mm-hmm. interacting with the president, um, um, you know, T- trying to make sure that uh, that the ship is moving in the right direction um, is, uh, you know, I, I guess what I would say is that a, a chairman uh, acts as a uh, almost as a consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, it's he's there to uh, to bring to bear the expertise he has uh, and the judgment that he has for the uh, you know for the benefit of the administration. Um, and then ultimately the benefit of the school. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, you know, sure, there are responsibilities to stand up at a social event and, and say a few words, a few mm-hmm. positive words. There's a responsibility to attend, I, I feel there's a responsibility to attend Gambit. You know, so when I'm in town to, to, to be part of the ongoing life of Canisius High School. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, primarily it's, it's to it's to make sure that the ship of state is um, is moving forward in a positive direction. Oh, okay. So, did the board or did you help initiate the iPad program? And how do you feel about the current I status of the iPad program? Well, I I will uh, you know you're talking to someone who's technologically challenged. <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky if I can get my iPhone to <laughs> an- figure out how to answer my iPhone. Um, the iPad program was in uh, in effect when I became the board chairman. So the mm-hmm. decisions with respect to that program uh, had, had already been made and, and, and mm-hmm. the funding had been obtained. It, it, you know, I mean, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to see that technology is hugely important mm-hmm. in, 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 in the world currently and in the world of the future. And uh, if you want to, to be in an educational institution that's at the cutting edge, uh, you've got to have a program like this and you have to you have to be on top of the developments and you have to make mm-hmm. it excellent, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis. I mean, mm-hmm. the changes, as you know, are dramatic every day, almost. So uh, I'm a very, very strong supporter of this. And mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to the senior class uh, coming, you know, to my apartment here in, in, um, uh, in Buffalo and, and helping me understand how to use my, my Apple uh, computer, you know, I mean, it's, it's just if I could you know, just turn it on, that would be helpful. <laughs> that would be helpful. And so, what attracted you to pursue a career in the legal field? Well, remember, I t- <coughs> excuse me, remember I talked mm-hmm. about the fact that I was in debate and oratory. Yeah. Um, so that's Canisius. I went to mm-hmm. to Fordham University. Um, you know, I I, I started out uh, in in debate for my freshman year at uh, at Fordham. And, um, and I didn't, uh, I really wasn't connecting with it at all. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I, th- I found it to be incredibly nerve wracking. Um, uh, you know, trying to establish yourself as a freshman and then at the same time, um, 
uh, having to prepare for these debates that were taking place every every weekend. I mean, I just couldn't do it. I had to make some choices. Mm -hmm. um, and so my career veered off in, at Fordham into um, student government, um, and and mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know that's that's the leadership role, and it's um, uh, you know Vietnam War was raging. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were all kinds of po political activities going on. Um, you know, you, you didn't, if you had the opportunity to go to professional school like law school, uh, you wanted to take it because you really didn't want to end up in Vietnam. So, um, um, you, you know, the thought of, of graduating from Fordham and then not pursuing further education was uh, for me it wasn't even an option I mean I wanted I wanted to be able to kind of wait out the war I mm -hmm. don't think I had any particular desire to be on a ship to Vietnam um, so it, so the, the the whole nature of my background you know the the ability to to, to uh, communicate mm -hmm. um, to the uh, the English major that I had that I had taken at Fordham uh, so that I was able to be a fairly good writer um, these are all skill sets that you associate with lawyering, mm -hmm. and um, and you know my my view was, it's funny I had a conversation just a few minutes ago with my niece who's trying to decide whether to, to go to law school or medical school, and and I was saying to her, well you know, going into the professional schools gives you a lot of optionality, mm -hmm. and and that's what I perceived when I went when I went to law school. I said you know I don't know that I'm going to practice law when I get out of mm -hmm. law school. But I do know that I'll be able to read the law. And if I can read the law, I'm going to be able to do a lot of things with it, mm -hmm. with, with that ability. You know, maybe I'll run for politics. I don't know. Maybe I'll, be a, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Maybe I'll be a lawyer in a small firm, maybe a large firm. You know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do pro bono work. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it just seemed to me, I could go into government. I mean, it just seemed to me that there was this, this spectrum of, of opportunity that that, that I needed to, to be able to access, and the key to that access, the key to that those doors was a was a law degree. So um, I don't know. It was just, um, and and then it, you know, then it, I suppose I should also say that probably sixty to seventy percent of my friends went to law school too. <laughs> so it was you know it, that all reinforces mm -hmm. itself. You begin to to kind of encourage one another to do what you know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was it was just a kind of a natural thing to uh, to do, and it kept options open, and it just seemed you know it seemed logical. And following that <laughs> law, when did you start working at Morgan Lewis and Bacchus? Well, I didn't. Um, Morgan Lewis and Bacchus is the is sort of the final phase of my career. Mm -hmm. Most of my my career was at a firm by the name of Reed and Priest, and and Reed and Priest was a uh, a boutique, a small law firm in New York. And at the time that I chose to go with Reed and Priest, um, I had a, an offer from a firm here in Buffalo as well. I actually had two offers. And, and the, it's interesting because the, the salary difference at the time was $2,000. So Buffalo firms were offering $14,000, and the New York firms were offering $16,000. Oh. And, um, and $2,000 was a fair amount of money, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the time, 1973. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I decided that I would fi try to find a firm like a Buffalo law firm, only in New York. Mm -hmm. So instead of the mega firms, I, I decided I wanted to go to a smaller firm. And, and Reed and Priest had, had um, uh, was a very well-regarded firm in the world of electric and gas utility uh, law. So, um, so that's where I, that's where I chose to go, and I was with Reed and, Reed and Priest uh, for most of my career. Uh, we we merged with another large firm by the name of Thiel and Marr and Johnson and Bridges in the late 1990s, I think it was 1998, and um, and that firm uh, was uh, was active and viable and successful for 10 years as a merged firm, and then in 2008. The partnership uh, voted to dissolve that firm, mm -hmm. and at that point, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to go to Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. And Morgan Lewis and Bacchius is a huge international mm -hmm. law firm, and I went there as a partner, 
uh, and was a partner most of the time that I was there. Mm -hmm. And then as you started to move toward retirement, uh, the first step down was senior counsel. Yeah, okay. And then after a year of being senior counsel, you know, then you had to mm -hmm. uh, decide whether you wanted to retire or not, which I did a year ago. So being a lawyer, what's been one of your most challenging and difficult cases? Well, um, I guess what I would say is you're going to be surprised because of the electric and gas utility comments that have been made mm -hmm. here. But the most, I, I have to say that one of the, probably the most interesting case that I worked on involved um, the embezzlement of $100 million wow. by a, um, an investment advisor who started out in New York and then moved to, um, uh, to Geneva and Paris and, and put his headquarters uh, there. And I think partly he moved to Europe because he, he knew he was about to be found out. Mm. And I represented, <clears throat> there were two, two major clients, that, two, two major uh, families that had invested in his investment vehicle. And I represented one of them. And um, it, it, was a, um, it was the type of case that uh, you could write a miniseries about. I mean, ev everything mm -hmm. that could possibly happen uh, in a case uh, happened. I mean, an example is that um, and if, you're, if you decide to become a lawyer, these kinds of things can actually happen to you. Uh, my life was threatened. Um, I was, I, we, we were so successful in seizing assets from this man who had stolen them from our client, embezzled them from our client. And we had seized them in New York, we had seized them in, in Baltimore, we had seized them in Paris, we had seized them in Geneva, we had seized them in London, you know, and just mentioning those cities and understanding that there's a whole process associated mm -hmm. with trying to seize property, I mean, that was pretty exciting. But, th but finally, uh, this guy who had been on the run for a number of years was um, uh, was turned up in uh, Miami, and he, uh, um, you know, we were in touch with the State Department at the time, and uh, some a friend of mine just happened to come across him in a parking garage in Miami, called me up, said, said, you know, what is what is this guy doing out in the out in the loose, and I called the, the State Department, and they sent the, they sent a SWAT team over and arrested him. Well. And uh, he ended up in the Miami-Dade Correctional Center, and then was and then was extradited to Switzerland for trial. Um, and the, I'm getting to my story; it's long-winded <laughs> or to the point. But the, the so we were in so we, it's he's one of only two people in the history of the country that have ever been extradited to uh, Switzerland for for trial. So we were very successful in getting that done. And this you know this involves a team of people, and it's mm -hmm. it's all very exciting, you know. But. Um, but anyway, so we had the, we had the trial in um, in Geneva, and 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 his his family, the the guy, the embezzler's family, um, decided that they were going to threaten me. They said that they were going to assassinate me when I was in um, when I was in Geneva. Now this is this is not good news when somebody says this, and especially when you're six five, and you're you're kind of a head over mm -hmm. everybody anyway. So. Um, I, I paid no attention to it. I thought this is just nonsense. These are people that are out of control, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, 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 I'm fine. I'm not going to pay any attention. But the partners of the law firm, when they heard mm -hmm. this, they said, we want you to have protection when you're in Geneva. So for a week, I had a bodyguard. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, believe it or not, it's hard to have a bodyguard. I mean, it, I mean because, mm -hmm. you know, the the person is attached to you at all times and it's like you don't know whether to ask how he's doing or you know have a nice conversation with him or whether to keep your mouth shut or whether you know you or whether to make sure he's standing in front of you at all times you know so he can take the bullet if one comes uh, so it was very very uh, uh, hard for me to kind of figure out how to deal with him and it didn't help that the guy was he was about five three <laughs> so I was saying to myself, you know, he may be protecting my heart, but he isn't going to be protecting my head. You know, so I was, I spent a lot of time kind of ducking, you know, ducking behind him. Um, uh, you know, and ultimately the, the, the guy was, uh, the uh, embezzler was convicted and spent time, more time in jail. Um, but that case was, um, 
uh, was a very, very visible case internationally. Uh, a lot of the uh, items that we had seized from this particular guy's apartment in Paris. Um, now, mind you, I mean, we, we, this is, I'm, I'm gonna, this was stuff that was in his apartment. So it's seized, and then in 1992, there's an auction in Paris, uh, which was considered to be the auction of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was at a hotel called the George Sank Hotel. And it was, there were 5,000 people showed up for this auction. Um, and the, we, we generated from the auction $25 million. So the stuff in his apartment was worth $25 million. Uh, and it was, you know, it was just, a, it was an amazing event. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there, there are lots of stories associated with that. But uh, that, so that case involved probably 10 years of my life. Your attention, please. Not every day. Connor Garofsky, please report to the dean's office. Connor Garofsky, please report to the dean's office. Jeez, I, I think they just called me to the dean's office. Do I have to <laughs> go up there right away? Um, yeah, so that case, uh, just it was very visible. Uh, as I said, the articles that were written, the interviews that I had to participate in, the um, uh, you know the the um, uh, the assassination um, attempt, uh, the, not attempt, but the threat of assassination, mm -hmm. uh, made it kind of an, a memorable part of my legal career. So, following switching gears from that yeah. side. Back to Kenesha's. So being a past graduate who did not experience the graduate of graduation, but who has witnessed several, do you think it is beneficial and do you wish you could have experienced it? Um, well, so we're talking about grad at grad? Yes. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, my, my, re my reaction to that is a little complex. Um, I, I really have to say that I stand, I stand in awe of the young men here who are able to stand up and talk about themselves in the way that I witnessed recently. Um, I, I tried. I tried to put myself back in, in my you know my days here at Canisius, and I don't think that I would have been able to say what these young men were saying about themselves. Um, about their families, about the way in which Canisius had, had changed them. I also think that Canisius is a very different place today than it was when I went to, mm -hmm. to Canisius. I mean, I think that the, you know, when I went to Canisius, the, the fundamental value was discipline. I mean, that was, and, and there weren't really pro programs that, if you, you could be in debate and oratory, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that was how you learned to stand on your feet and say something. But there weren't other oppor opportunities for uh, for that for learning that type of, of, of uh, expertise, mm -hmm. and, and I think also that uh, I think that the world was a little more private. I mean, I just I think I think maybe it's technology, um, maybe it's learning with respect to the raising of, of families and children, but the the. That the the freedom with which you know these young men talked about themselves and their families was uh, was an experience that I've I've not seen before and and um, and I don't think that I personally would have been able to do it uh, certainly back in 1966. Mm -hmm. So um, now having said all that and being uh, and being you know admiring it and, and understanding its value, um, some of the commentary struck me as is really really personal. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of wondered whether, you know, whether that was always a good thing to be, to be standing up and to be talking about, you know, your families and your life in, in such a personal way. But that just may be because it may be that my reaction is, is, is a reaction of someone that's just more private. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, if, if I'd come through the experience of Canisius High School today, maybe I would be perfectly comfortable doing it. But I think my story would have been relatively dull uh, compared to what I listened to. And final question: How do you feel about the long-term future of Canisius? Oh, I think Canisius is—I think Canisius is an incredible institution. Um, 
I think the fact that I can tell you that the Canisius of today is so different from the Canisius mm -hmm. that I graduated from in 1966 tells you a lot about the, uh, the flexibility of the school and its, its willingness to embrace new methodologies, uh, academic, you know, continue with academic excellence, but in, you know, in a different way. The iPad program, I mean, these are all uh, incredible tributes to the, to the faculty and the administration here. Um, I, I think, you know, Canisius is about to celebrate its 150, 50th year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my work on the board is, uh, is you know, I, I have a very clear vision that, uh, you know, that I'm working to position Canisius for a number of generations to come. So I think, I, I think, I think you're going to be, I think we're going to be around for a while longer. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'm not saying Canisius is perfect. I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, I think we, we all strive for perfection in our own way. Um, the striving for perfection is as important sometimes as attaining it. Um, and I, uh, I think Canisius has a, a, a great future in, in Western New York. And uh, I think as long as it's true to its mission mm -hmm. and its values, uh, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's here to stay. And being a student, and I'm sure all the alumni are glad to hear that. Or I hearing, hope so. Yes, <laughs> that they can be confident in their school yeah. like that. Well, I, you know, I, I mean, again, I, I try, I continue to invest in Canisius because mm -hmm. I, I believe that it, um, that it uh, is a unique institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, you know, I can say that because I have some experience with other institutions that, you know, that try to do the things that Canisius uh, does, mm -hmm. but they they they're still struggling uh, mm -hmm. with fi financial financial issues, and they're struggling with the uh, the academic issues as well. So, um, you know, as I said, you're not perfect. We're not mm -hmm. perfect, but uh, we're 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 sure striving in that direction, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Um, it's, the pleasure is all mine, <laughs> thank young you. man. And, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the student body for keeping Canisius on the right path to success. And that does it for this edition of the Crusader Alumni Series.